Cool, we're up to 201 people. So um, just a, a quickly before I hand across to David, just to say thanks to everyone for coming. Um, it's great to see lots of familiar faces and lots of new, pe new people too. Um, just as a brief introduction for those of you that don't know Deepak and myself, we both work for IO Associates. Um, we're a Bristol-based tech recruitment company. We cover the whole of the UK on contract and permanent. I specialize in placing contract.net developers and Deepak, you guys can all see, is on the permanent side. Um, if you're looking for a new role or hiring for your team, we'd love to hear from you. Um, and I think we're pretty much ready to hand over to David. It's worth saying I, I first reached out to David, I think it was well over a year ago, maybe even 18 months. So we were, we were really pleased to, to be able to get him. So yeah, thanks very much, David. <laughs> and awesome. um, in terms of, terms of questions, if you guys just want to put them in the chat box um, or... And then David obviously will try and try and read them. And if any are missed, just kind of resend them at the end and we can cover them, cover them then as well. But I think that's everything from me and um, from me and Deepak and we'll hand over to, uh, to David. Awesome. Can, can you see my screen? Is it showing the slides working? Everything is good? Yeah, yep. I got the screen. Yep. Completely. Cool. Yep. Um, awesome. So I'm David. I'm a partner software architect at Microsoft. Not, that, that doesn't mean much. Um, and the, the talk is about implementation details and why they matter for software. Oop. So the, it's funny, the, this title, um, Partner Software Architect at Microsoft is, is interesting because I think people are, are familiar with principal and kind of senior engineers. I mean, the way, the way I describe it as at Microsoft, you're kind of in an RPG. Like you're, you start at level zero and, and you go um, and you can go as, as high as you want to go. Um, partner is, is the level above principal. It's just on, on ladder of, of things. Um, I'm on .NET. Um, I'm one of the co-creators of NuGet. Actually, NuGet was one of my first things at, at Microsoft. It was before package managers were, were a big thing on, on the platform. Um, Signaler, as I think some of you have used. It's been at core um, and the new Azure Signaler service. And there's a new one called the Azure Web Pub Sub service as well. Um, so I kind of helped build a bunch of those things um, in my career so far. I spent a chunk of my time helping a lot of customers, both um, external customers and internal customers, debug and diagnose complex issues in .NET. Um, I've given a, a couple of talks in the past at NDC on, um, on, on how to write code that, that follows the um, best practices to avoid issues with, with scaling. And I've been thinking about this talk for a long time um, based on my experience working with, work, working with both, both first party and third party customers. Um, and then if there's time left over, um, I'm usually in meetings all day on Teams. Um, and I write code sometimes in between, in between um, those, those um, as well. And then I actually have a life outside of work as well. I, I play tennis, that's not in the slides. I have, two kids and a wife <laughs> who see me on occasion, um, I, I promise. So, so what this talk, um, this is the first time I'm giving this talk. This talk is brand new. You're the first ones to see it. You tell me if it sucks on Twitter, not, 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 not on my face. Um, <laughs> um, the .NET over the last five years have been, has been evolving into a modern, um, I don't want to put cloud focus because not everyone's in the cloud. So it's, it's a modern high performance platform that, that, that is competitive with the best platforms out there, like the Rust, the C++, like it is on that level. Um, but it, it does require engineers who are trained in .NET to kind of rethink patterns and, and, and what they've been learning for the last I don't know, 20 years. Um, so I've been spending a chunk of my time helping teams move their platform, move their libraries and services from .NET front to, to .NET Core, sorry, .NET 5 and beyond, it's called .NET now. This is super hard to kind of distinguish between the two things. Um, and I also spend a large chunk of my time helping them diagnose problems. And, and out of that comes a set of like things you see over and over patterns and, and, and coding, coding, I want to say problems, coding patterns that kind of appear that don't work well at scale. Um, and there's a lot of FUD in, in general in the industry around the fact that premature optimization is the root of all evil. I think that is, there, there is definitely some truth to it where you don't want to kind of micro optimize to the point of, of um, to the point where you don't get the, the returns you want. At the same time, it's good to kind of understand why this exists and, and why you want to actually optimize your code so, so it can scale, right? 
you want to be the, the, the next slash dot hacker news Facebook. If you're building, if you're if you're trying to build that kind of service, you want to be able to write code from the get go that scales. Um, also, I, I do think performance fundamentally needs to be an input into your design. Oh, sorry, FUD stands for fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Okay, so, someone answered it. Um, so why do they matter? Um, I remember a time when we, we were having a, a heated discussion at Microsoft like five years ago, and someone said, don't worry about that. It's an, it's an implementation detail. And the other person got super, super like angry and they were like, no, that actually matters because it affects the experience. Turns out in a lot of cases, like the details matter just because software is built by humans for now until we get replaced by AI. Um, but for now, humans make assumptions about, about scenarios, about you know, specific things. So when, when we design APIs, when we design a new feature, when, when you design anything, you basically have an idea in mind of the usage. You have an, an idea of the caller, you have an idea of the calling patterns, how, how often it's gonna get called, et cetera, et cetera. So like, if you don't understand the assumptions that were made, um, it can affect your, your app at scale. Typically, if you don't have a lot of big data or, or a lot of users, you don't see the problems. So if you're a very simple application that, that doesn't need to handle a lot of data or, or inputs or, or processing, you may not have these issues. So like with a grain of salt, this isn't for every single application, like don't go and figure out how to optimize everything. But just having a mental model of, of those assumptions can help you write code that scales. Um, and then you don't want to dig into like every layer of the stack all at once. You want to figure out how deep you have to go. Like, how do you root cause problems um, by digging into actual details and, and, and figuring out what things are, are relevant to the actual problem at hand? Um, like, for example, I, I haven't dug into the hard, to how the JIT handles the hardware and like I haven't gone that deep because I don't have to, right, from, from my problem space. So what are some examples, examples of these assumptions? Th these are kind of things that we talk about um, in passing. And whenever we design an API, whenever we are in reviews and we're talking about you know, a, new, a new way to, to call some, some, some new thing, there'll be things like, you know, there should only be a handful of these in practice. And then we'll get a dump from someone who has had a crash and there will be a thousand of these things and there were supposed to be two. Like, what could you be doing to have created a thousand when we thought there would, there would be two? Like, check your assumptions, right? Um, this should only happen once at startup, so it can be expensive. Maybe it's cash. Maybe I just need to pre-populate my entire cash once at startup, and I don't have to worry about it being expensive. So, like, you you can use all the super inefficient code at startup because who cares, right? Um, no one's gonna create this once per request. This thing is probably not on a hot path, right? We, we, we should talk about hot paths and, and what that means, but, but in general, when we design libraries and, and APIs, we're thinking about these kinds of things. We're saying, okay, this API can be kind of expensive because you know, it, it only runs once at startup. No one is ever gonna have to do this more than once at startup. And if you don't understand that and you call it per request, you're gonna have a bad time. And a lot of these assumptions are really hard to express in the type system. So there's, not, there's no first class way in C Sharp to say, okay, I'm gonna express that this API is only for, it's only for use in not in a hot loop, right? That is not a thing that, that, that exists. That requires super advanced code analysis that doesn't exist in, in any language that I'm aware of. Um, so there, there's cer certain things that, that you can't express um, in the type system. And we do do our best to name APIs appropriately, like dangerous blah, if the thing is supposed to be dangerous, um, or unsafe blah, in case it's unsafe. Um, but there, there's some things we cannot express as part of the API. You can't just have, you can't just have to read the documentation and understand the assumptions. So what does at scale mean? I think, so this is, this is probably the trickiest part of, of this whole talk. Like not everyone is writing software that, that, that runs at Facebook scale. Like, Hardly anyone does, right? Not everyone is Netflix. At the same time, everyone wants to be. You're, they're, they're like the, the reason you're working for your business is because you probably want to grow to some scale. Um, so scale can mean the number of users. It can mean the size of the data. It can mean the number of times that that data has to be processed. Number of requests, for example. So what, what, you, what you're trying to avoid is you're trying to, to avoid a situation as, as best you can where 
the amount of data or input our users changes, and then all the code you wrote now fails because it doesn't scale. It was never meant for that kind of scale, right? Typically, when, when you jump an order of magnitude, you go from 10 to 1,000 or, or 10,000 or, or 100,000 of X. It could be data, it could be users. You need to rethink what your algorithms are doing in your, in, in your application, right? Um, let's say you were trying to ingest CSV files. And in year one, it was like a couple of megabytes. And then in year five, you got Hacker News and people started to upload gigabyte size um, CSVs to your pro to your application. Did you write the code so that you wouldn't like blow memory? Was that was that in your in, was that in your was that in your thought when you were doing it the first time? Um, and then the other part of scaling is scaling as an engineer. Um, you need to you need to basically understand. You can't go deep everywhere. I mean, you can if you want to. If you have if you have infinite time to kind of spend, you can go deep in every single facet. Um, but typically, the engineer wants to get their job done, so they kind of have to know what to care about and what to ignore. Um, how much do you actually need to know? So this is the hard part, and this is the part where I don't have a, a, an answer for you, but I think it gets better with experience. Um, you need to be, so I would say be curious in general to, about learning about your domain, whatever you're working on, try to dig into that area. It, it kind of stops you from having to kind of read 10 books up front to get started. And, and once you're building something, you can kind of say, okay, I want to understand how blah works. How does the next layer down work? I'm calling this API, what does, that, what does it actually do under the covers? And that helps you kind of explore in, in a depth, depth first kind of way without having to go broad and kind of get confused about these 10 concepts that, that aren't, that aren't um, there, there for my, my actual application. There will be a point of, 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 of returns where, where basically you don't, you're, you're trying to figure out how the system works and you've gone too deep. You're in the weeds, right? It's, it's when, it's when you're, you're basically tweaking something or changing things or trying to learn things that don't really matter. And knowing where that line is, is really hard. But it come it, it gets better with experience, right? Um, an example of this could be imagine you were trying to optimize something and you got to a point where it was it was fast enough and you just kept hammering on it. You you remove every allocation, you remove all the, the, the bad code, and you weren't seeing the gains, you're probably at the point where you you, you can stop now, right? You want to keep measuring, but but it's it's time to stop. Um, figuring out how things work at a conceptual model based on the implementation is super important because um, it, it helps you kind of not have to go deep in every single area. So for example, like if I told you the GC runs more often, the more you allocate, that, li that little tidbit is kind of a, a mental model for how to think about how, the, how you can use the GC. If you can build up that kind of mental model for all for different subsystems or, or libraries, it can help you quickly diagnose or figure out if you're doing the right thing in a high school situation. Because if you're doing a thing that is supposed to be cheap or expensive and you're doing it kind of in the wrong place because you understand the overall concept of this structure, then you can kind of quickly go, you should never be using a concurrent dictionary per request because of blah, right? Because you understand the overall concept. Um, I'm not sure if Cliff Notes are a thing in the UK. Is it? Give me a nod, somebody. Cliff Notes, Cliff Notes are the, are the like, summary. So like, Thinking back to, to like to, to, to school in, in Barbados, like when you were told to read To Kill a Mockingbird or, or some book, you would just get the cliff notes, right? <laughs> you would read the cliff notes and get the summary. You want the cliff notes for your areas, right? You want the cliff notes for .NET framework for like the, the API you're calling. That could be a super cool web, a, a good um, site to build actually. So, the, so the, okay, so someone should go make a new uh, domain, cliffnotes.net where we stash all the cliff notes for, for different APIs and, and behaviors in .NET. You get it there. And then how do you learn the details? Well, I think one good way of learning it is to build things. As you're building something, you know, dig into what you're building. Um, read, read code others wrote. This is a big one. Um, learning from others is a, is a huge, huge deal. And I think with the, the advent of, of open source in .NET, Things are, are much more open now and it's getting much easier to kind of learn different techniques, different patterns. Um, you can learn a lot from actually reading comments in code if people actually comment their code. Comment your code, by the way. If it's, if it's not obvious, write a giant comment in your code explaining what that is. Um, 
talk to subject matter experts. So if you have, if you have, actually you do have access, you, you have access to the, to, to the team who builds .NET on GitHub, definitely ask questions there for things that are not obvious, for things that, for behaviors you see that, that don't make sense or that you, you, you want to understand more, more deeply. Um, there's Discord rooms, there's Slack rooms, there are people who are experts in different areas. You can actually get access to them. Read, read the documentation, including the fine print. Um, this is something I don't do myself. So I, I, I put it there just because it, it looked good. Um, I read docs like, like all of you after I've tried to like make the API work the way I think it should work. So you bang your head against the wall, you try using the API, it's not working. And then you read the docs and go, oh, could have saved me like an hour or a day, right? And then debug code. Debugging, I don't see enough people talking about debugging as a core software engineering skill. It is a huge like deal to be able to debug code, step into the actual like implementation and with source link and all the new tools for being able to step into like arbitrary source, like decompilation, you can kind of step in trivially to like implementations of the framework of library code, and you can figure out how things work, right? And then once you're, so I, I put stack overflow answers because I thought it was a good idea. And I think it still is a good idea at the high level, but some bad answers get a lot of upvotes sometimes. <laughs> so take it, with, take it with a grain of salt or a bag of salt. Um, and then once you, once you do all that, read the source code again, right? Sometimes it isn't actually obvious what the code is doing. Like it's easy to say, read the source code, but you kind of need to build up context to read source code efficiently and appropriately. It's hard to know why things are there. It's hard to understand all the pieces. You have to gradually build up a mental model of the source in your head. So you can't just kind of go and look at the code and go, oh, it's doing that. It actually takes time to go figure out how to like grot the code and ingest it um uh, yeah yeah train someone else exactly <laughs> david versus Jowski. <laughs> it's funny comments um yeah so d definitely read all the code all of it right again so is this a performance talk in disguise yeah yep um yeah i was trying to come up with a bunch of issues that weren't performance like but for the most part, when you're talking about scale, the kind of the kinds of issues you hit, like memory leaks because you're doing too many things and you have too many things in memory, they all end up looking like performance issues. So for the most part, this is a performance talk talking about, about things. All right. So let's look at some examples of these assumptions in .NET. What kinds of things in .NET do you use every day that kind of have these built-in assumptions that you aren't that you probably don't need to care about unless you were doing something that, that mattered, right, um, at scale. So the GC, for example, the garbage collector optimizes for throughput, not for reduced reduce memory usage. That means that if you have a set of memory and the GC sees you have a, a bunch of memory and there's no memory pressure, which means you, you are not within like 90%. I think by default, we say if you're at 90% memory capacity, then you're under memory pressure. If, if there's no pressure, and there's no need to collect. You can think of it like, like a really lazy garbage person who's coming to your house only when the garbage is like, it, it's overflowing, right? You need to be 90% full of garbage in your house before the GC comes. And this is important because I see a lot of bug reports probably once every three weeks that said the GC isn't working. And I'm like, if the GC, if the GC wasn't working, I think we'd know that it wasn't working by now, right? The GC does not run on a timer. It, it does not collect every interval. The thing that drives the GC is allocations. If you don't allocate, nothing will collect, right? So even though you have a bunch of connections that connect to the server side and they do a bunch of stuff and things and the connections then go away, the GC will not clean up unless you have gone over some thresholds for collection or if you're under pressure, right? Memory wise. Um, so that, that, that's a good mental model thing to have in your head because those are just like assumptions that, that are built into the system and, they, and they're documented, but you kind of have to dig in to kind of understand this. This isn't a thing that, that is obvious from, from, from trying to use .NET. You'd have to know this, right? Um, timers are a super in interesting one, I think. Timers, if you look in the source code for timers, timers, the comment is like, I think a screen, screen size. And it articulates that timers 
that, that the assumptions that were made in the implementation were that timers are fast to create and destroy. With the assumption that they don't fire often. If you think about creating a cancellation token for an operation, right? So you're doing an operation, you create a token that, that times out, let's say in uh, 10 seconds, right? You say, if this request, if this outbound HTTP um, request takes more than 10 seconds, I'm gonna kill it, cancel it, right? For the most part, you expect that token to fire pretty rarely. So we thought, okay, we should optimize for insertion and deletion of timers into the, into the, 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 the timer queue. Um, the way timers work in .NET, our timers are stored in a linked list, a W linked list. So whenever you add, it's a very simple operation to add. And, and if you remove, same thing. But when you actually want to fire timers, it is not optimized. So firing timers is actually very expensive in .NET, where you have to loop over all timers in your timer queue and fire them one, one at a time, right? If you were to look at other platforms like Node.js or Go, they actually store timers in a more efficient structure for execution, where they're, they optimize for not adding and removing, but they optimize for being able to find the timers that need to fire next very quickly. So depending on the patterns where things are being used, we'll kind of make adjustments over time um, on, on how we think people in .NET should be using these APIs. But I don't know if, if anyone here knew about timers, like timers are actually optimized for the kind of one behavior. And what happens is you end up using it inc incorrectly or, or outside of our assumptions, right? And issues come up. And then we have to go, go figure out how to readjust our assumptions for, the, for these things. Um, we, made a, we made a change to timers in .NET 5 where timers are, are kind of generational now. So during the first scan, we will collect the timers that are gonna fire the next time. So there's kind of two lists, the, the, list, the list of things to fire next, which is, which is typically sh shorter and the full list of things. Um, and, that, and, that, and that we did because there were a bunch of teams internally with a lot of timers. Um, and our initial assumptions were bad for those scenarios. So we made tweaks to it. Um, configuration we think should be built once per connection, once per application at startup. We had this case where we saw a team that shan't be named um, spinning up a connection uh, configuration per request with file watchers. And as you can imagine, like in production, when the load got high, there were thousands of thousands of file watchers hanging around in memory, eating all the memory up. And we were like, how is that possible? And then it turns out they had some code that was run that, that, that ran per request in their hot path that needed up a configuration object just to parse some JSON files off disk. So the next set of examples, the next part of this talk is showing you examples from the real world um, to hopefully help you contextualize some of this super abstract discussion around um, implementation details. Microsoft is the, one of the biggest customer, customers of .NET. Pretty much the entire company is built on .NET and, and is used for, for applications and large scale services. Um, and since, since I've been working with that team, working with, with a bunch of teams internally, we, we kind of have built up this knowledge base of, of issues and, and, and fixes that are interesting. And these code samples are all in the hot path. There's actually pretty, pretty cool, um, a pretty cool technology inside Microsoft. When you build a service, there's this profile, profile that, that, that can run on your service and collect traces in production at scale. Um, and, there's, and there's a whole team that manages that, 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 that manages that collection, that infrastructure. And essentially what it does is it will wake up every, I think twice a day for 30 seconds and it will take a CPU trace. So we can actually see like for these, for these services, these services can, can actually see where time is spent in their applications to figure out what to optimize in production, not, not in, on the, the, the dev machine. So you're experiencing real load in real situations and you can go, oh my gosh, we spend 20% time um, trying to do this weird calculation, right? Um, things that are really hard to replicate locally with real scale. All right, I don't see any questions. This says this, has, this is about service fabric. What, what did we say? Um, let's get one. All right, yeah. So 
this is a joke. If you if you if you um watch Law and Order, we've changed the name the name of the teams involved to protect the innocent. So there's no shaming going on here. And I think by using Microsoft, it's a good way to kind of articulate that everyone makes these mistakes. This isn't just like a you know I'm a senior dev and I'm smarter than everyone else and I don't make mistakes. No, like these devs are at every single level you you can imagine at the company, right? At the company that makes .NET. So if you see code that you wrote on here, you should feel good because it's the code that, that, that we write too. We're all in, in the same boat together, right? All right. All right, let's look at some code samples. This, I hope is interesting. And everyone can get involved here. This is, this is, this is supposed to be the part where I'm, I'm in the audience and I show you something and I ask you a question and it's back and forth but it's virtual, so it's different. So I'll give you time to digest this sample, give it a good code of view. I'll be right here, just staring at the screen. Everyone's trying to find the problems with this code. Like what is wrong with this code? It does what it says it does. Decompress bytes. Looks fine, right? Nothing crazy. Code is, no, okay, no comments. I love the, the chat so far. Flush before dispose, not async, buffer allocation. Good, good. Everyone's spotting stuff. Zip bomb, oh my gosh, zip, uh, zip bombs are, are a real problem. Oversize 4K, and these comments. I love the comments thing. This code should definitely have comments. Why does this code not have comments? It's because it couldn't fit on the slide. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Error handling, while compared to zero. Cool. Th this code doesn't have any fundamental bugs, but I love that everyone's looking for bugs and looking for issues. There are, there are issues at scale. Um, let's talk about some of them and what, what they are. But first, let's try to understand what this code is doing. It takes in a byte array called raw. And this is the compressed data from somewhere. It came in from somewhere. And it returns a byte array that is decompressed, right? So you basically need to grab a gzip stream because that's the only component in .NET that, that can decompress stuff. And then we allocate a separate buffer to read data, read the decompressed data from the gzip stream and then we copy it into the memory stream in a loop. And then once that's finished and we're all out, we return the two array. Cool. We dispose all the streams, everyone's happy, like it's all good. So we have a buffer for input. Turns out when you create a GZIP stream, it actually allocates this eight KD buffer internally because it's trying to not give the, the underlying library, um, Zlib, I think. It's trying to give that big chunks of data because it's, it's, it's expensive to decompress like small chunks of data. So it's giving, it's actually giving it 8K, it's trying to give it 8K at a time. Um, so you can't, you actually can't turn that off. That's just built in. Up until .NET 3.1, I think, this used to be an allocation, like not from pool memory, it used to be a new allocation every time per GZIP, per GZIP stream. It's much better in .NET, I think three or five, where we actually use the array pool to allocate. But once you have a GZIP stream, you actually, you actually have a, an 8K buffer just hanging out there for some time. And then we allocate this buffer to copy bytes into. And then when you create a memory stream, guess what is, is behind it? A different buffer. Memory stream is essentially a byte array that, that expands. It's essentially a, a, a list of byte, I guess you'd call it. Um, and it doubles in size every time. So it starts off pretty small. I think the default is like a hundred and, I don't even know what it is. I'm gonna guess 128 bytes and it doubles in size every time. So whenever you double, you, you pay the resize cost, right? Um, so you wanna understand that. And then we are reading data Decompress, so like when you call read, let, 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 let's think about the layers here. When you call read on the stream, I'm gonna put my mouse. 
it has an AK buffer internally because it's trying to not use your buffers in the zlib code. So it basically has to read data into the AK buffer internally, and then it copies that data into your buffer, and then it gets copied again into the stream. So there's like three copies here, or two, two copies here, right? Um, just burning bytes over and over, back and forth, churning through them. And then when you're done with the overall operation, you call two array on, on, on the stream. Super convenient. This code actually looks pretty clean. It's just doing a lot of work that isn't really required, right? Two array is important because two array needs to return an, an array of the right size. Recall that the memory stream internally doesn't actually know how when you're going to stop writing. So it, 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 it allocates a buffer, doubles it over and over and over. And then you start writing at some point and you have a buffer that, that is kind of too big. And, and the data is some, somewhere in between zero and length of that buffer is your actual data. Um, to array will create a new array of the right length and copy it from the internal byte array into the byte array that gets returned. Also like to array could never return the internal array because that's dangerous, right? Like, Imagine this memory stream was being used by something else afterwards. You can't just give it the buffer that was internal. So two array will always allocate a new array and return it to the caller. Um, there is an API on memory stream to get the internal buffer called try get buffer that you can that, that could be useful here. That would give you the array segment because it can't be an array. It has to be an array plus a slice of where the actual thing was written to because as I just said before, you you the memory stream doesn't actually know the length of the data that you're going to write. Um, so let's talk about what this is doing. So here's the hard coded AK in, inside the source code of um, Deflate Stream. Deflate Stream is used by GZIP Stream to do the the compression and, and decompress operations. Um, this pattern is extremely common in server applications where there's bytes coming in and streams and people are doing memory streams into array. Memory stream is basically a foot gun. Just be super aware that when you, when you use a memory stream, it is very expensive. It is, it, it is an expandable buffer. If you aren't cognizant of the size of this input, like let's say this starts off at like 4K and you're fine. And then it ends up growing into megabytes. You're probably not fine, right? You're in large object heap territory in the GC, which is which is basically a place where you don't want to have to be, right? Um, yeah, so large temporary buffers that are thrown away are really a bad anti-pattern. You want to avoid that. Um, it can wreak havoc on the GC and, as, and, and, and on your app as a result. The more you basically allocate and use the GC, the more CPU the GC will use, and you'll have more time spent in, in the GC. So like when people blame the GC for like being bad, it's, you're the one allocating, like you have to stop doing that to make the GC stop working so hard, right? Um, so be, be mindful about buffer allocations and copies. If you use a, an, array, an API that does two array or anything that, that, that kind of gives you the entire set of memory, like in the, the entire set of data in memory, follow that read all text, um, Follow that read all bytes, like those kinds of APIs are bad at scale. They're made for like super dinky apps that don't need to handle a, a base set of data. Or if you're on a mega big machine and you don't care about, about, about memory, have at it. But for the most part, those don't work super well. Um, use streams and pipelines for large data sets. You wanna keep everything in stream for, for as long as it can be so, so you can do transformations in place without having to, um, get the entire payload in memory all at once. You want to work on things in chunks so you can like decompress a 4K buffer and then pass it on to the next layer and then pass it on to the next layer without having to do the whole thing all at once up front. All right. It's MSDN detail. No, so like this is the nuance, right? The, 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 the question is about this, this MSDN documentation documentation detail expensive operations of memory stream. Expensive is in the eye of the beholder. This becomes expensive once you hit a threshold. And we, we should document that. I'll put it on my list. Um, but you need to be, you just need to be aware, like there's nothing here statically that tells you that that raw is going to be huge. This could be a 2K, a 2K buffer. And like for that, you're fine. 
you're still wasting a bunch of memory, but like it, it won't affect things at scale. It's when the input starts to get bigger, like because you got Hacker News, that this whole piece of code like dies in a fire, right? Yep, and then pool and reuse buffers when you need to operate on in-memory data. So here's the fix. So this fix is, is kind of cheating because it, it basically says like, just don't do that stuff, use a stream. It turns out the code that was calling that decompressed bytes, returning a byte array, wrap the result in the memory stream and then pass it to another API. So there is no purpose in doing that work at all. All you had to do is return the GZIP stream directly to the caller. Yay. Yeah, and, and sometimes when you, when, you, when you optimize code, you have to actually change the patterns. This is one of those times. You change the return type, it's viral. Everyone has to kind of change up stat to how they decompress things now. This one, okay. Look at this one. What the hell is this, is this code doing? Why is it trying to do this? Like optimize the string. It's so funny. If you see a function in a code base called optimize, you know it's doing something like wrong. Just assume it's wrong in the first place. Optimize the code. So this one is much smaller than, than the other code sample. Um, it, checking for to see if a string is interned does anyone know what string interning is like it's a cache right it's a cache trying to basically give you a reified instance of a string so if you pass in foo as a as a value that is read from a file and one that's read from like the internet i say give me the intern version of foo i get the same instance right so two different two different instances of foo go in and I get one that comes out, right? Because it hashes, it, ca it caches that string value as a key. Um, what is this? All? I actually don't know what is called optimized string because um, it isn't actually doing the optimizations. It's just checking to see if the string itself is interned. Another weird thing is, is intern returns a string. It doesn't actually return a bool. So is intern actually returns a string that tells you if the thing is, it gives you the intern string if it was interned, otherwise no. Let's think about how is intern has to work, right? I, I just told you the, 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 the input is a lookup value and the result is a cache, a cache value based on that input value, right? So in, from first principles, think about how this has to be implemented somewhere. Like string and turning isn't some magic feature in, in, in .NET. It turns out like there's very, there's very little magic in the runtime and in .NET and the GC. Those things all use arrays and queues and lists and dictionaries that are just like normal. Um, turns out this thing, okay, this is some C++. I can't read this. I actually don't know C++ very well and I'm fine to admit that. Right. Um, this this is from the runtime itself, from the string and turn table. And essentially, it takes a global lot and does look up into a dictionary map. And like this is this is exactly what you what you think it would do, right? Like if you were thinking about this from first principles, you would go, well, I need to somehow look up a string instance by string key. Um, how would you do it, right? Concurrent dictionary, obviously, string string, and you would, whenever someone calls is intern, you would do track it value and you would be done. Turns out the runtime does the same thing, but with, with less concurrency. Um, it actually tries to be lock free if the string is intern. If it isn't intern, it, it, you, you get this lock. And that code was actually in a part of the .NET framework, probably is still there today, I'm not sure. Um, and it was in a constructor of some where type. So that, that constructor, whenever someone created that constructor per request, it would take this global lock on a dictionary and it caused a ton of contention. <laughs> Interns, no, this is like, this is like senior engineers that, that wrote this code. Um, yes. So yeah, not, not good. And it turns out this code didn't even need um, to intern strings. I think it was, it was kind of a remnant from something that was there before. And the string 
if the string is already interned, you don't pay the cost of the lock. If it is interned, if it isn't interned, um, which was the case in this scenario, you pay that, that global lock cost for every single call. Pretty bad. All right, this one is longer, so I'll give you time to look at this one and digest it. This is from an internal telemetry system. And there are a bunch of operations and, and operations have child operations or child actions in this case. Um, and this ran per request and was trying to collect all the operations that happened in that request. Someone told me that you know it is from Microsoft because the funk of operation to bool is predicate and not filter. Don't know what that means, but we used to have a predicate delegate before funk in action. We're a thing in .NET. So this is a, a breath first search, breath first search. Um, there's a hash set of IDs that the, the walk already saw. There is a queue of operations and it enqueues the root and then runs through a, 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 a breath first search um, algorithm where it dequeues the item, checks to see if it was there already, if it is, then continue. Otherwise, add this activity to the current list of seen activities. If this is an operation that I care about based on the, op the filter passed in, return it. Otherwise, link your brains out. Child operation, child actions dot where is completed to list for each in queue. Um, so anyone see the problems with this code? I don't want to say like this code actually looks pretty clean, right? It looks fine. It would, it, it works super well until they hit a load factor in their application that caused problems, right? Link dot any. What does dot any do? Does anyone know? Dot any is pretty, I mean, it's, to, be, to be fair, dot any is pretty efficient. Dot any will check to see if the collection is an I collection or a list or an array. And if it is, it will check to see if the count is greater than zero. If it isn't, it'll actually allocate an enumerator and call move next. And that happens every single iteration. Now, in this case, you're using a queue and the JIT can see it, you would assume, like, I'm sure people assume, like, the compilers are super smart. They are not. They're dumb as hell. They don't, they don't optimize anything. C Sharp does not op optimize stuff. The JIT is trying to get better. It does not optimize as much as you think. So this, this actually calls link is any. There, there, nothing gets in line to optimize here. It calls that. Um, and then we're, we're doing this where clause, which is super functional and cool. And then we allocate a list. And then we use the functional for each call, which allocates a new delegate every time this loop happens. So the code looks fine and probably works fine for most cases, but it's doing excessive allocation. And the, the, I guess the tricky thing here is that you're thinking about how big these allocations are. When you call to list and you don't pass in a size, right? To list basically needs to allocate an empty list and then add every element from the from the enumerable into that list and as you add entries to a list it does a resize so it throws the away the the internal array away does a resize and copies elements from the old array to the new array so imagine you were trying to do two lists on an, a list that had a thousand entries you would start from zero and then you would get to the threshold which i think is four by default and then you get to four and then it would get to eight and then 16, and you would literally be creating arrays from zero to a thousand, right? Um, divided by log two, I guess. So this is kind of hard to see the fixes, but I'll point out some of them. Just use count directly. Um, I believe any is fine for this case. I, you don't have to change it, but may as well. Replace the contains call with add. Add for hash set actually tells you if the the idea was if, if the thing that you added was added already. So I can just not call contains and just call add directly and skip the call to contains. And then just, just do a for each. Like there's no delegate, there's no extra allocations. 
if you are looping over an array, like if you for each over an array, the, comp the compiler will turn it into a for loop. It's super optimized, it's very fast. Um, and this is actually readable, I think, more readable than, than, than this super cool functional style. This is just the worst part of the two lists here. No allocations, right? And this is a very simple transformation. Um, so let's have a hard talk about link. Link is, is super powerful and expressive. It shouldn't be used in your app's hot path. You can definitely use link in parts of your code that don't need to scale. Um, link is a very easy way to kind of save CPU cycles. The link code is, is, is as optimized as it can be, but at the heart of it, the core of it, like is trying to, to be super abstract and generic and work across any enumerable. And even though it has a, a bunch of shortcuts for various cases, the, the performance cliff is extreme. If you hit a case in link where you end up enumerating the whole collection or reversing the whole collection or doing things like that, and the list is significant, you can end up with bad performance. So you need to be aware of, of where you use link, right? Um, and, and we do every release, like try to, try, to, try to optimize link more and more, but it's still very expensive to call um, different patterns. This one's easy, let's, let's go through it quickly. This, is, this class is a custom JSON DOM node for some reason. This team built their own, maybe because the one we had, maybe because we didn't have one yet in .NET. Does anyone see the, the um, A problem? I should say the problem. Put it in the chat, put it in the chat. Is any better than count? It is, it is better than count. Any, any just does, um, it enumerates the first element to see if there's anything in the collection. Did someone say this dot versus, that's funny. So what happened to stir just never gets used. So we create a string turn it into an array, and then we just use the array and not the string and it just goes away. Probably works fine for the most part until the data passed in here, it gets big, right? Then you're like wasting a string, creating a char array from it, and then parsing it here. By the way, the people say char or car, because char is the only right, right way to say it. Car is, if you're saying car, just change your life right now. You're, you are incorrect. Um, so instead, <laughs> it's, not, it's not a car, it's definitely a char. Um, so you call get char instead of get string, and that works too. Even better would, would be to basically just parse the byte array directly right here. Then you wouldn't have to allocate an intermediate char array just, to, just for parsing it to find the JSON nodes, but this code was, was using chars anyway. So super small example, that's a fun one, yep. Okay, oh my gosh, Arch Nemesis, take a look at this one. Process that with your brains. Do not try to parse the regex. I didn't parse it myself. I actually don't know what it's doing. I just know that it, someone wrote this and it does what they think it does, right? So create a regular expression. I hate these, but I know they're useful. So I will bite my tongue and go, like, if you're gonna use a regex, just know what it's doing. I know the pain you're about to um, cause yourself. It gets the ID by parsing the path passed in, the potential ID. It gets this local path and it gets the system path, I don't know, what these are, it tries to parse the, the potential ID as a GUID, and then it does a case insensitive comparison by doing to lower first. No one talked about the, the Turkish I and to lower invariant. All right, so, oops, I go forward or back. So here we are compiling a regex per method call. That sucks. Calling to lower calls, not as big a deal. Yeah, th this probably just has a, a correctness problem. 
Um, but the compiled register per call is the is a big big problem here. This is like a really bad performance issue. When you pass compiled in, it's actually doing a lot. So the code, actually, I tried to paste it on GitHub. The code for a compiled um, thing is 5,000 lines of code. So the way this works is you pass in the compiled flag to that constructor, and it basically will compile and express, uh, it compiles IL on the fly that is made to parse strings for that specific expression you passed in. Um, and there's a whole like theory around state machines for, for th this stuff. By default, if you don't pass compiled, we actually parse the text that you passed in and we create this state machine that is interpreted, right? We transform it into, into a machine that can be interpreted. Um, and then if you pass compiled, then we, com we convert that interpreted kind of intermediate format into IL to that runs the state machine on your string, right? Super efficient. Um, I don't see, I was looking to see if they were cached. I don't think they're cached um, at all um, while I was looking. So every new call will emit a new method. So you, you probably have a, a memory leak as well here. So you wanna cache these aggressively, just cache the expressions that, that are compiled. So here's the fix, like move this thing, cache it and compile it once. And then the rest are just, are just kind of like clean up stuff. Like if you're gonna check for a GUID, parse it first. If it's not parsable, then like return um faults and then you can do a case insensitive comparison to make sure that that works instead of trying to do trying to use too lower on the file system apis um i think someone someone said dot net will cache five of these and then after that it'll cause problems um probably reddit source generator it may be I think it's still a problem. I think most people have constant regexes, I think. Um, so maybe that would work. Um, the, the stat, stat, if you statically compile the code for a regex at compile time, that would definitely go away. Um, I don't even know if we're shipping that in .NET 6. So you might know more than me. I haven't seen it appear anywhere. This is a fun one. This is an easy, easy, easy one, easy one, everyone. So I pass in the enum to get log level, returns a string. Like, what does this actually do? I want you to put on your hats, your engineer hats, and think about how this has to work. Like you are now a dev on the CLR team and you have to implement enum.toString. How does it have to work? What is an enum and, and what's on an enum, right? The enum has values and it has names, right? So the enum basically has some representation, some storage, right? Um, so what, what ends up happening is you call to string and there's this call, right? Get enum info. Get enum info, luckily it's cached. Um, it calls into the runtime, it parses, the like assembly for the enum, it finds the, the, the information about the enum, finds the names, finds the values, and it stores them in managed code on some structure. The structure has, it's called enum info, and it has an array of names and an array of values, right? So enum info does a bunch of hard work in the runtime and returns you essentially a, a bunch of key value pairs, right? But in two arrays, one array is the values, one array is the actual uh, names of the enum, enum. Um, and then for some odd, um, and by the way, this is code, I just learned about this, like pre preparing for this talk, it's fun. Um, and then for some reason it does a binary search. So, so you do two string on log level, that is a specific log level value in the span of values for, lo for log levels. It does a binary search to find the index into the array where that value is. And then it does an, an, an adjacent lookup of that index for names. So let's say you had a bunch of log level en the log level enums. It would say like zero is debug, one is, I don't know, trace, two is, is information, et cetera. You find 
let's say your information, it would binary search to find like three. And then it would say, okay, what's the, what's the name of the um, third value right here? I have no idea why this would be a binary search. To be honest, like I, I don't know of anyone that has like 5,000 values in their enum. If you know of any code that, that, that does that, I would love to see it. Um, but yeah, there you go. So every time you do that to that two string, it does a binary search and then it returns the, the number. But it looks convenient. Instead, you could just like write a switch statement. And you could use name of two to make it like even more, even better, right? But this is just like much more efficient, constant strings. So someone said binary search should be faster than going through the entire enum. Huh? Hmm. Huh? Are you sure? Are you sure about that? Are you sure about that? Are you sure about that? So what is the number where you think binary search begins to matter on modern hardware? We actually, I actually sent a pull request to the run to the runtime to change how we look up prime numbers. And, and there's a giant like list of prime numbers that someone chose like, I don't know, 20 years ago that were correct for, 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 size, for sizes to resize collections to. And we do a linear search through a list of, I think like a couple hundred there because it's faster. And because like searching from the left is, is people start with very small collections. So, so going from the, the, the least to the biggest is better. Um, binary search is, is log n is better than n for search, for those who know big old algorithm and thinking about how this thing works. Like you need to be a sizable n on modern hardware for binary search to, to matter like to, to, to be better than um, a linear search. Also, the linear search on .NET, like for scanning an array, is actually vectorized. So it's, it's using modern, modern hardware instructions to kind of skip through the arrays super fast. So I'd be super surprised if binary search mattered for enums, unless there was some traumatized person who experienced an enum of a size of like, I don't know, a couple hundred or a thousand. I just, I just have never seen an enum that big. Maybe if you co-generate an enum, I can see that, but beyond that, it, it would be kind of insane, I think. All right, here's some code from the memory cache. This is us pointing guns back, back at ourselves. Like, we got the issue, like, here. I'm sure I didn't write this code, but maybe I did. Um, so here's the method, is scanning for expired items. So give it a read, digest it. So it's, it's taking the cache in, getting the current clock and the current now, and it basically runs through the list of entries, the values for those entries, and checks to see if they're expired. If it's expired, remove the entry. Pretty nice, right? I see someone saying allocations. Is someone just saying that allocations because that, that's all I focus on? Maybe, it could be, but yeah, you're right. So this is a concurrent dictionary, but what does that mean? So it turns out dot values in the concurrent dictionary actually allocates a new collection. After locking the, the entire dictionary, it snapshots the collection after locking the whole thing. Ooh, ouch, that happens every single time it scans. And we scan pretty often for expiration. So anytime you do a get like on, a, on the cache, it scans in the background, uh, which is kind of inconvenient. Concurrent dictionary, beautiful type that we overuse every single time. So is conceptually a dictionary with, with locking at a level that isn't the entire dictionary. Um, if you go back to like computer science days, which we all forget and burnt in our brains, like we, we want to be gone. Um, you implement a dictionary by having a bunch of arrays, right? And the lookup into the array is based on the hash of the key. So you have a bunch of buckets and someone says, give me the value for five or some key. And then you, you get the hash code and then you like find the bucket that, that, maps, that maps the hash code and then you're good, right? But that's what happens in a, in, a, in, a, in a normal dictionary. When you're concurrent, something has to give. It either has to be lock free with some crazy algorithm that I don't understand or you can just lock. 
So if you were going to implement your own concurrent dictionary, you would have a dictionary and you would just lock the whole thing. Super easy, nice to understand, won't scale at all, but you can grok it. So instead, concurrent dictionary locks at the granularity of a bucket in a dictionary. So each of those buckets that, that you have to, it locks around those. Um, so reads are lock free and writes are not. Writes actually lock. So when you try, when, when you call get or add, when you call try add, when you add to the dictionary, it will lock the bucket. It won't lock the entire dictionary, it will lock the bucket itself. Um, when you access certain things on the actual dictionary, if you access keys or values or count, it locks the entire, it, it locks every single bucket on the concurrent dictionary and returns values. Um, we had a situation that was actually pretty interesting where we were trying to diagnose an, an outage in an Azure service um, for a customer. And the, the it ended up being a bug because every single request, someone was doing concurrent dictionary.keys and that took down the whole service. It's pretty funny. Um, not for them, but it's like, oh, interesting. So some APIs take snapshots. Um, some allow enumeration while um, while while it's being while it's being modified safely, but you you kind of have to know these. I think I'm not even sure if these are documented. They must be. I, I'm assuming that we're we're amazing and we document everything. So I'm assuming we document that this is actually lo um, locky if you call dot keys dot values or count. <clears throat> um, when you create a concurrent dictionary, it defaults to a number of concurrent rights to allow. On the, on the concurrent dictionary. And by default, it'll allocate like the number of cores you have as the, the number of locks to take. Not documented, I don't, I don't believe you. Let me go fix that right now. Um, so the fix is actually simple. Turns out you can enumerate the, the dictionary itself and it is lock free and it handles mutation and you will, it will mutate as you loop over it. It won't be a snapshot. Um, and it doesn't allocate. So this is actually the change that was made in .NET 6 just now by a contributor. All right, so some lessons to take away from that. Measure what you care about. I didn't talk about, about running a profiler, but you bet you definitely want to use a profiler to find these issues. The trickiest part is that it might be really hard to replicate the kind of traffic you get in production locally, but you have to do your best, right? Find the hot spots, find the things that are per request that aren't wants per application and profile those things, right? Um, think about how things are implemented. You wanna look at the code and don't think it's magic. Don't think that like the people that build the APIs are super smart. We we are smart, but we aren't we are magic. So like string that's, I think string is intern is a really good, um, version, a, a really good example of this, where it looks like, like a magical API that like is GC magic or something, but no, it's just a dictionary with a lock. Like we're all humans, we, we, we build the same software. Um, quick to call is not the same thing as quick to execute. And this is the hard part. You need to figure out which parts of the code base need to be quick to execute and spend time making those fast and optimize those. Definitely don't optimize the entire code base. I mean, you can, but you definitely want to figure out where to spend your time, right? And the compiler is not as smart as you think it is. The compiler is, it really isn't like smart enough to kind of like re change, hoist things out of loops and do all the crit, like it just isn't. Um, it could be, but it isn't. Um, this isn't bad code. We're all on a learning journey. This is to say, like, if if you if you see yourself in these slides as I do, like biting your pencil and you get frustrated, then don't feel bad. We all do it. These are from senior engineers at Microsoft, senior principal engineers engineers at Microsoft that make these mistakes. Um, no one's perfect. Learn from the code you've written in the past. Like, gain insights from what you've seen. Learn from people that make presentations about the slides that <laughs> like these. Um, I actually learned about the enum thing while I was doing this talk. And I was like, man, I guess that makes sense. That sucks. <laughs> and I have to go make sure that our code isn't, <laughs> isn't doing enum.toString. 
Um, so this is a tricky part. When you dig into implementation, you need to be aware that the details change a lot, like a lot, super often. And the, the more active a code base is, the more likely the details will change. So make sure you know about the newest things for your platform and what you're working on. As an example of this, enum that has flag used to be insanely inefficient. Like just, you would never call it just too, too slow. In .NET 3 or 2.1, the JIT can then recognize that pattern and make it better than the code you wrote by hand. Cool, right? So now, now all, all, of your, all of your knowledge from like optimizing, optimizing that pattern is, is dead and, 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 it, and it's no longer, no longer important because that is now a new thing. Um, does FX Cop have rules to tell you about these pitfalls? That is a super good question. I actually had one of the architects review this talk and he is actually working on a bunch of performance analyzers for some of these patterns. Um, I think some things are really hard to figure out statically. They're kind of like assumptions that have to be made. Like if we could, if we could annotate more APIs that were like presumptuous, like, okay, if you call, if you call memory stream not to array, we don't want to warn for that because that's fine to do. It's just, if you turn on high scale mode, it'll start being like, ah, high scale API alert. Don't, don't call this API. Um, details change, but concepts don't change as often. So we may tweak dictionary. We, we may tweak the performance of, of, of searching for, for an index. We may tweak those, those fundamental things. But if the overall algorithm hasn't changed, it, it shouldn't affect you much. It's more like, oh, it got faster. Oh, it got slower, whatever. It's only when like we do a big rewrite, like if we change how timers work, if we change the trade-offs that were made, then you should 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 um, figure that that's a thought. In .NET 6, um, we made cancellation tokens much, much cheaper to allocate. They're super light now. Before they were much heavier. And the and the trade-off that was made was we assume that these are, are transient and not and not um not allocated once per application, but once per request. But as a result, now adding and removing to a cancellation token from like different threads performs worse because we assume that that's a rare case, right? Um, always measure, 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 measure. Measure things you care about. Your intuition is terrible, right? Um, so the recipe that I think kind of works for me and you have to figure out which parts of it work for you. You want to build a mental model of the big parts of your system, build a heat map, in your brain, figure out which parts are hot and per request, which parts are cold, like at startup, and which things you actually need to optimize, right? And spend your time on those things. Um, what is the hot path? We didn't define hot path, but I think people in, can intuit like a thing that runs in the core part of your applications, like logic. Like, I think per request is the easy one to think about um, as a mental model for, for how to think about the hot path, the thing that, that, that runs a lot in your application, the core piece of logic. Um, figure out how those parts work, down to the, down to the relevant, relevant details, not don't go digging into like the assembly. I mean, you can actually do it for fun, but you don't have to, right? Um, and then optimize your code appropriately. And I think that is the end of my talk. Thank you everyone for coming to see my first performance talk like this. Lovely. Uh, has anyone got any other questions they'd like to ask? I take it no. So thank you very much to the community for coming, obviously, and David for agreeing to, to speak to us. Um, this session has been recorded, guys. We will send out the YouTube link up later this week if you'd like to rewatch. And we would also love to have your feedback on the future speakers or any topics that you'd like to hear please drop us a, at an email or a LinkedIn message. We will be announcing our next speaker next week. So yeah, keep your eyes peeled. Uh, thanks again for your time and we look forward to see you next month. Awesome. Really, perfect. Thank you very much. Thanks, David. That was great. Yes, thank you, David. Thanks all. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. That was cool. Thank you. Yes. Right. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Extremely cool. It's just going to um, give me a load more work. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be even busier now, Joe. You have no idea, Stella. <laughs>
the hash the WTFs per minute is astonishing. Right, I'm gonna go and deal with some children. Cheers all. Good luck, Joe. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Oh yeah, children. I should deal with them too. They're gone. I'm, I'm free today. <laughs> <laughs> again, David, when you're uh, we'll have to grab you again sometime soon, David, and uh, especially when you're in the UK as well. So, oh yeah, yeah. it's been great though. Thanks very much. And Thanks yeah, lot. as Deepak said, guys, it's recorded, so we'll uh, we'll get that round. It'll go on go on YouTube as well. We'll we'll tag you in, David. Awesome. How many were here, people overall? At, at the uh, I've seen like 200, 250 Yeah, I think oh, no. that was the that was the number maximum number. Awesome. Nice. Yeah, very nice. Yeah, and from all different parts of the UK, because we run the different meetups, like London, Thames Valley, Cardiff, some from the Southwest. Yeah. Not only cool. UK. Or probably all around the world. I was yeah, yeah say, oh, we're away. I'm from Germany. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, or some guy wow. from Brazil as well, I think. Yeah. Wow, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Portugal, USA, I'm seeing some messages come in. Romania, nice. Even though the notification came in a little bit late on my end, it's like two hours in front, got the mail for it. <laughs> oh, the Netherlands, <laughs> France, Turkey. We are amazing. international now. Peru. Sweden. Just wanted to say thanks, David, and uh, you downplayed it great, but big rats on being a partner it's, it's huge <laughs> at your age i think it's freaking awesome man uh, and well deserved you've done some great stuff for microsoft really appreciate it thanks a lot definitely gave me a lot of ideas what i can optimize in my bots that i'm programming <laughs> yeah awesome. discord based server management Got a jet doing right. deploy in a couple of minutes. Awesome. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you for arranging, everyone. David, what's your favorite upcoming C Sharp 6 API? Uh, C Sharp 6? Try again. .NET 6. Oh, let me C -Sharp see. 10, um, 6. <laughs> in a bias, I mean, for, for me personally, the, la the Lambda improvements, because we we're trying to get them in for like the, the small API stuff. Um, the other thing I'm looking forward to, maybe struct records. Yeah, also, okay. and required properties are going to be interesting because constructors suck for version. Yeah. Like they're just <laughs> nullable context. Yeah. yeah, migrating old code. I, I don't want to add constructors, so that's like huge. So yeah, I look forward to that. Yeah, as well. yeah. Um, I'm trying to get this feature into C sharp for like I don't know how many versions. No, it's it's incredible how long it takes to get a new feature into the language it's just like years of bait time like forever debating things and like extension everything extension properties oh my god we were waiting since like c sharp like i don't know eight or six <laughs> it's like when are, when are we gonna do this but when, when you get involved in the language design it is just insane the level of detail they think about like if, if you're not in that space and you sit in the meeting you're kind of just like Oh my God, they're thinking about how every other feature that, that was ever designed interacts with this new feature. And it has to gel like perfectly or they'll just like toss it out. Yeah, so the API designs um, and sometimes I'm like, oh, this will take 20 minutes. And it's like two hours in. I'm like, wow. <laughs> God, just like, I know nothing. <laughs> just call it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we, we are, we are a, a pedantic bunch, a pedantic bunch about that stuff. I, I told someone, I said in an interview, I said, our team ships APIs, so we spend a ton of energy making sure that, that they're correct. So you'll see us argue over names because that's kind of the thing that we spend time doing, right? Like that's our product. We ship these APIs to the public. That's our, our thing. It's not a service. It's not a thing. It's like APIs are, are the actual product. So they have to be perfect. And we spend a, too much time probably arguing about names and shape and it needs to be just, just right. Hot reload. How is hot reload coming? Hot reload is going to be incredible. You know this. You know this hot reload idea. Like, I don't. Want, I don't want to say it was my idea, but I asked a question, like four years ago. I said, "Can we just hot patch the the framework?" And people were looking at me like, "Yeah,", yeah. but no one did it yet. And then for and then all of a sudden, like in this version, 
everyone got gun ho on doing it. Not, not, I mean, once it happens top down, it, it, it's pretty easy to get, get to happen. The bosses go like, make hot reload work, and everyone's like, okay, we'll make it work. It is a game changer. I agree. If we can make it work well, there, there are a lot of like complications to, to making it work well. Just like trying to hot patch like generic types and, but apparently I've been told that everything so far is just work. It's not fundamental. So it's just someone has to go type super fast and add more features. So. More questions. When that's the only problem. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there are more problems, but so far I haven't heard if any like, workforce oh. would be the only problem with stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> just get a bunch of talented coaches. Yeah, right. But, but I doubt it. it would, what is stopping? Would be so good in training. Would be easy. Yeah, the go-to stack in OSS. I think the thing stopping us is perception. <laughs> the fact that it's called .NET is a big problem. Well, that starts Microsoft. And Microsoft, we we, we actually I actually did a, a user study that was pretty fun um, last year for like a year before year before for like a year. And it was talking to non-.NET customers and we had them use .NET and we asked them their impressions before. And one person was like, my dad used that. <laughs> 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 I was like, oh, Fun. okay. <laughs> Funny enough, my dad used that. <laughs> you see? There, there's the impression, <laughs> the impression, and it's, I mean, it's, it's accurate that .NET is enterprise. And yeah people don't even give it a chance because of that. Like, and then it's funny, by the end of the interviews, people were pretty much like, I could use this, right? I think, I think we bring a lot of value to the, to the table. Like we, I think unlike other stacks, we have a lot more in the box. That could be a detriment, but I do think you can get a lot further by default in our platform than any other platform like on the planet. When Microsoft started to open source their framework, it changed so much. Yeah. Before before that, it was like, yeah, Microsoft is closed. I need to do a JIT decompiler to see what it's actually doing. Yep. And I can just do Git. And yeah. And that changed my view of how .NET evolves. Before .NET Core, before the open source, it was like, yep. oh, no, I need to do Microsoft. I'd rather do Mono, yep. uh, do it on Linux, and uh, and then do that. And with .NET Core, oh, my God, everything is open. Uh, yep. I used to do, so I remember when we were building ASP.NET Core, we had the meeting with like Scott Guthrie and, and the big bosses about what to do with, what, what to do next. And we, we wanted to open source it from the get-go, right? And this is like in 20, like 2014, like in the very early days. And we did a demo, we showed them the stuff. And then I remember Scott Hunter have said, we want to open source like yeah. ASP.NET Core. On GitHub. Is it, is it three Scots? Uh, Scott, Scott. It was, Hunt. yeah. So we, yeah. we didn't have Scott Hansman in the room, but it was Scott Hunter and, and, and um, Scott Goo, Guthrie. And I was there just yeah. demoing stuff. I remember he just said, he just turned and said, like, open source all of it. And we were kind of like, who's talking to us? Like, what? <laughs> it's all of it. It's like all of it, the JIT, the runtime. And that was like, holy crap, we're going to go big with this thing. That's how the whole thing like end up on GitHub. It's nuts. Do you, do you think it's also from the top that it came, or was it really Scott that says I want it open source, or does somebody else? Uh... He was near the he was near the top at that time. Yeah, I mean, yeah, he, still, yeah. he still is, but it, it definitely it the, the sentiment definitely was around stagnation and cloud yeah. and the fact that like, like Docker was out right. And we couldn't run on Docker. Like there was no Docker on Windows back then. It was all just Docker on 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 yeah. on non Windows. And we were basically missing this boat. And it was pretty obvious to us back then. We we're like, oh, we're not going to be able to use any of this stuff anymore. Um, it's why the first version of ASP.NET Core was was mono and full framework. And Core yeah. CLR only appeared after like we we spent a, a bunch of time trying to figure out if we could build a cross platform .NET ourselves versus just using what was there before. All right, cool. Yeah, I gotta go. Stuff. Yeah, bye. <laughs> Thanks a lot. See y'all. Have a good one. Peace. Thanks, David. Peace. Bye, Thanks, guys.
Thank you. Cheers, guys. Thank you for coming. Thank you for attending.